Let's pray together. Precious God, thank you for bringing us here together today. And God, we thank you that we can praise and we can worship and we have the assurance that you are walking with us always, that you love us, that you forgive us, and that we are yours. God, as we come to this place, we ask that you calm the stresses of the week and let us just focus on you. Let us be still and have a moment to just love you. God, as we give our tithes and our offerings, we ask that you take them and use them for your glory, that you further your kingdom, and that your love will stretch across this earth that needs it so much. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. And that wouldn't be good for anybody. So we're glad that you're here. Thank you for coming and joining us today. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We are glad that you've come to be with us. If you did not do so as you were coming in, we have gifts over on the table for you and we have information there. We hope you'll go by and pick that up and introduce yourself to some of our greeters. But we uh, we just are glad you're here and we hope that you'll come back and be with us again in the future. If you're joining us via live stream, welcome. I ran into several people during the course of this week who said they were been joining us via live stream. We thank you for being here. If you want to send us any message, you can go to the address you'll see on the screen and just let us know that you have prayer concerns or other things that we need to know. We'll try to respond to those, but we're glad you're here, and thank you for coming and being with us. Uh, I know the room is a little bit uncomfortable this morning. One of our uh, air conditioning and heating units has gone out. So one side of the room is very cool, and one side is very warm, so if it doesn't suit you, move to the other side. We, uh, that's about the best we can do for you today until we can get that fixed. Uh, we realized it was out at the early service, couldn't do much about it. So uh, we hope that it will be comfortable enough for everybody. Let's pray before we begin here. Lord, let your spirit be upon us as we come to this time. Let the teachings that we hear and that we experience be something that can sink within our souls and that can help us to be the people that you would have us to be. Come, Lord Jesus, and let your spirit fall upon us as we come here. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I may have told this before. If I have, you can just sit back and enjoy round two of it. There are two birds that fly every day around the Mojave Desert. It's easy to spot one of them. It's very hard to spot the other one. The first one is a hummingbird. The second one is a vulture. The vulture looks for dead things. The hummingbird looks for bright colored plants in the desert. The vulture has a very keen sense of smell. It can smell decay from miles away. The hummingbird has a keen sense of eyesight. It can spot bright colors from miles away. What's the point? The point is we can learn some very valuable lessons from these two birds. Both of these birds treasure important things. They both serve a purpose and they both find what they are looking for. And we can do the same thing provided that we're looking for the right treasure. There are lots of things that we can treasure on this earth, but what we treasure is going to determine our character. It's going to determine our usefulness in the world. Our scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 23. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your hearts will be also. What's Jesus trying to tell us in this passage that we're looking at? What basically he is saying is we look for what's important to us and then we invest in it, which means if Jesus is truly important to us and if we want Jesus to be a treasure for our children, for our grandchildren, for our friends, for our neighbors, for anybody who's truly important to us, then Jesus is going to get a top cut of our time. He's going to get a top cut of our possessions. If, if Jesus isn't getting that top cut, then our investment is going to reveal the true priority of our hearts, and it's going to reveal our true character in life. That's what Jesus meant when he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's Jesus' way of saying, 
We become what we believe. Almost a hundred years ago now, when Dr. Harry Emerson Fostick was the senior pastor of Riverside Church in New York City, he was invited to go on a tour to, to Palestine in the Middle East, and one part of that invitation was to come and speak to the students of the American University in Beirut, Lebanon. Back then, the American University had students from all over the world. It was a huge honor to get to speak there. Dr. Fostick was invited to go there, and so he did what most pastors do when we're invited to go places. We say yes, and then we think, what in the world am I going to say when I get there? That's exactly what he did. Fostick spent several weeks trying to decide exactly what he was going to say to those people. He went there and made a very good speech, but what those people remembered and what's been remembered ever since wasn't necessarily the body of his speech. What was remembered was the opening statement of that speech. It was so powerful, people have been quoting it ever since. Fostick said, I will not ask anyone to change their religion, but what I do ask is, is that you would face up to a question. What is your religion doing to your character? Friends, if there's ever been a time in American history where we need to ask that question, it is right now. It certainly needed to be asked before the Civil War, and it was not asked, and it led to some very difficult things. We are also living in a time where we need to be asking that same question and living into it as best we can. Too many Americans are treasuring religion over Jesus Christ, and, and I believe that treasure is hastening the, the decline of the church, and it is damaging the witness of the American church to the people both in our country and around the world. Or to say it a different way, we become what we believe. Not too long ago, I made a comment on social media that got me in trouble. A politician who claimed to be a, a Christian had said some really nasty things in a speech that he'd made. And, and a lot of Christians were praising what he had said as if Jesus had said it himself. And so, being me, I jumped into the conversation and, and I told everyone why I disagreed with it. I challenged not only what had been said, but I challenged the people who were, who were praising what had been said. And then at least a dozen other people started lambasting me because I didn't agree with what had been said. Over and over, these religious people started accusing me of being judgmental and started telling me how I didn't have the right to pass judgment on this person. And let me just say, as a sidebar, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed getting Bible lessons from people who couldn't have quoted the great commandment if you'd have held a gun on them. But I'm getting a little off track here. I'm in a mood anyway, so here we are. Yeah. Anyway, that online discussion went back and forth at least uh, uh, for a half hour, maybe more than that. And it didn't end until I said one thing that nobody could argue with. I said, I am not being judgmental here. What I am being is observational. I said, by their fruits you will know them. That is, by the way they act. A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. So just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. I said, I don't care whether you liked what he said or whether you didn't like it. That's not the question. The question is, would Jesus have made that speech? If you can tell me honestly and with the support of the Gospels that Jesus would have said what he said, I'll shut up and I'll never say another word online. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. And the fruit of that speech was rotten fruit. And you can't make an argument that Jesus would have said what was said, period. I don't think I've ever seen an online discussion come to an end faster than that one did. And the reason that it did is because nobody could argue with that. Nobody could argue what, what I was saying. And the reason they couldn't is because Jesus, Jesus doesn't allow us to just act on our emotions and to speak from our prejudices. Jesus demands that we actually stop and ask ourselves, what would Jesus say and do in this situation? 
Jesus wants to possess our hearts. He wants to possess our voices and our actions. There are things in this world that I don't have to pass judgment on. All I have to do is watch and listen with the eyes and ears of Jesus. I don't have to pass judgment on that mother in Christiansburg who sexually abused her two-year-old child to death because her boyfriend enjoyed watching it. I don't have to pass judgment on a, on a Virginia Tech student who murders a 13-year-old girl because she was enamored with him. I don't have to pass judgment on Vladimir Putin and the horrors that he has created in Ukraine. I don't have to pass judgment on that pastor in Texas who said last week, homosexuals are an abomination and they should be removed from the earth. I don't have to pass judgment on any of that. All I have to do is observe their lives and ask, what would Jesus say and do in this situation? And the answer is, he wouldn't do any of that, so that's the end of it. I don't have to pass judgment on yet another politician who said last week, should we be spending money feeding children of illegal immigrants or victims of the Hurricane Helene, uh, <clears throat> the victims of Hurricane Helene? America is the wealthiest nation that the world has ever known. I believe Jesus would show up and say, let's do both of those. There are some things that you don't have to pass judgment on. Why? Because we become what we treasure. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. When you're, but when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light that you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? That's what Dr. Fosdick meant when he said, what is your religion doing to your character? It doesn't matter if it calls itself Christian, and it doesn't matter if it's being done by the church or by religious people. If our religion isn't producing a Christ-like character, our religion is wrong. If the light that you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? Just last week, the Catholic Diocese of Los Angeles paid out the biggest settlement that it ever had in the history of the church. The church was, it did that because the, the church for a very large number of years had, had, had turned its back as Catholic priests for sexually abusing children. And, and, and the church had to admit in, in open court that it had covered up those actions for decades. They moved pedophile priests from one church to the next to keep them from being arrested for what they were doing. I don't have to pass judgment on that. I don't care if it's the Catholic Church or the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or the Church of the Holy Mother of Pee Wee Herman. If somebody in the church is abusing children and somebody up the ladder is covering it up, it's wrong. Their religion is dark and, and somebody's picked the wrong treasure. By their fruits, you will know them. If our religion isn't producing the light of God's love in our souls, and if it isn't producing the light of God's love in the world around us, then we've picked the wrong treasure and we're worshiping the wrong God. Or to say it a different way, Jesus-shaped people have not been called to be the great spectators in the kingdom of God. Jesus' message didn't change the world because Jesus' people watched Jesus preach and then they went out and lived by the values of the world. Jesus' message changed the world because the Jesus people accepted God's grace into their lives. It changed them from the inside out. They embodied God's grace as the treasure of their existence and they went out and they lived that grace into the world trying to make sure other people knew it. They invested in the treasure that they had found in Jesus. Their minds were transformed by the Spirit of God, and they became Jesus-shaped people. They became the love of God in the world in which we live. 
This happened at least five years ago. Our church staff was meeting one day, and we were talking about how our church could become a more powerful tool for change within our community. As we were talking, Phyllis Redding, who's a member of our church, who was our office administrator at the time, she said something that I have thought about over and over for five years. She said, we all need to be asking ourselves, is Jesus walking in our shoes? The answer to that question is going to be found by thinking about what we treasure in our lives. Are we investing in the things of this earth, the things that will disappear and that won't matter when we're dead and gone? Or are we investing in the things that will matter forever, things that can bring positive change to the world, things that can change individual lives for the better, things that can bring God's love to the world, and that will help people see Jesus through our shoes. I don't usually tell stories about myself. I usually tell stories about people that are inspiring me or, or that have inspired the world that are around us. But today I'm going to tell a personal story. may have told it before somewhere along the line, but uh, it's still a story that I think is important because it's, it's about choosing the right treasure and it's about letting Jesus live in our shoes. A few years ago, I was at the Goodwill store. If you know me very well, you know that I don't go to Goodwill very often. I'm not a big fan of the man who owns the Goodwill organization. And there are a lot of people who need their low prices a lot more than I need them. So I try to just leave that store alone and let people shop there who need to go there. On this particular occasion, I went to Goodwill because I was hunting something that I could use for a Halloween costume, and I didn't want to pay very much for it, and so I went to Goodwill. When I got there, I saw this mother and her three children, and, and you could just tell by looking at them that they didn't enjoy the privileges of life that a lot of us are able to enjoy. That mother was trying her best to buy winter clothes for her kids, but even at Goodwill, she was having to keep a list of what she was buying and having to add it up to make sure that she didn't go over what money that she had there. While she was looking at these clothes, the, the older daughter, who looked like she might have been around 10 years old or so, she was over a couple of aisles away. She came up on this pink and blue jacket and and the little girl really liked it and so she tried it on and it fit her so she went and she asked her mother if, if she could get that her mother looked at the price and and even at goodwill she couldn't afford to buy that coat and buy everything else that she had to buy for her kids so she told her daughter that she was sorry that she just couldn't afford it so the daughter went over and she hung it up but then the daughter started getting very teary, and, and she didn't want her mother to see that. She, she walked off to the other side of the store. I watched all of that until the mother got through doing all the shopping that she needed to do. And then when the mother started up to the cash register, I went over, and I got that code, and I took it, and I put it down on the counter, and I told the cashier that I wanted to pay for everything that she was buying. The mother was shocked, and she looked at me, and she said, I can't let you do that. I said, ma'am, it's okay. This is what I want to do. This woman said, then, then give me your name, and, and, and I'll pay you back. And I said, ma'am, you don't need to know my name. I said, the only name you need to know is Jesus. He's the one that's doing this for you. I'm just his servant, and the only thing that I will ask of you in return is that someday you're going to be better off than you are right now, and there's going to be somebody else that's going to need a blessing, and so I want you to just pass it on when you have the opportunity to do that. Pass it on to somebody who needs the help. I gave that woman a hug, and I gave her kids a hug, and then I hugged the cashier because she was crying by that time. And then I walked out the door, and I never saw those people again. But when I left Goodwill that day, I was pretty sure, just about 100% sure, in fact, that those people had seen God's life that day. And I knew that family had been blessed by what had happened. And, and I understood probably as well as I ever had what Jesus meant when he said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As I'm telling you, folks, there wasn't in anybody's heart that was more blessed that day than I, mine was. My heart was about as full when I left that place as it had ever been. And I, and I truly believed that, that we had all been in the presence of Jesus that day as we gathered in that place. 
Jesus-shaped people are people of the call. We're called to respond to God's grace when it comes to us and to, and to let that grace not only change our lives for the better, but we're called to embody that grace to the world that's around us and, and to let people see Jesus through our shoes. And I'm telling you, people are going to know what we treasure in our lives by the things that we say, by the way that we act, and by the effort that we make to shine God's love to the world around us, to the people that we meet, to the places that we go. If you've never come to the place in your life where Jesus has become real to you, where he's become a treasure in your life, I want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ today, to, to ask him to come and live in your heart, to become that treasure that, that you need in life. And and, and if you have, I, I want you to make the commitment to, to let Jesus live within your shoes, to do everything you can to, to try to show Jesus to the world that's around you because you have no idea what kind of blessing it can be when you see it and you know that it's made a difference along the way. Jesus is a lot like both the vulture and the hummingbird. He takes dead stuff and he makes it valuable and nourishing. And he takes the bright and pretty stuff and he passes it on as the gift of life. May we do the same with our lives. God help us to not miss our moments in life. This is a moment that you have given to us, this very moment that we stand here today. You have given us a moment where we can meet you and we can hear you and we can know you. You've given us a moment where we can evaluate what our treasures are and what they should be. You've given us a moment where we have the opportunity to look at you and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Come and live within me. Help me to be the kind of person that you want me to be. Help me to find true meaning and true hope and true joy within you. Help me to live as the people that you want me me to be as the kind of person that you would have me to be Lord Jesus help us to seize the moments that are around us to look for those moments when we can make a difference and where we can help change things help us to look for those moments when we can actually become the shoes of heaven make us a vision of what you want us to be of what you would like the world to be of your grace, of your light, of your love, of your words, of your actions. Make this moment our moment of change and commitment. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you've come here today and you've decided to give your life to Jesus and you want to be baptized into the faith, come let us know that. And we'll be happy to help you with the next steps in in that journey, if you want to join our church and be on mission with us, we would love to have you. If you'll come, we'll, we'll help you with that step as well. As we go out the door, we're going into a world that increasingly is angry. Let's try to be the Jesus in our own shoes to, as we go out there. And let's try to show the world something that's better. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore.